Welcome to the official YouTube channel for the Colin Coward Podcast. Go on, hit the subscribe button. There you go, right down there. If you wanna be among the first to hear my weekly takes, NFL, college football, more, right there. All right, there we go. Kansas City 25-22. It hits the under by half a point. John Middlecoff, former NFL scout, three and out, who knows the Niners very, very well. Um, you know, I already thought San Francisco outplayed uh, Kansas City for most of the game. But then when you get to overtime, boy, there's some big advantages. Uh, Mahomes, uh, Kelsey, game experience, the kicker, Andy Reid. Let me start, John, by this. I thought both coaches, um, you know, players look nervous. Kansas City's young, overcoming. Mahomes overcoming a lot of Kansas City mistakes. I thought the play calling and the play design was pretty spectacular. Um, I mean, that's just my interpretation. I, I thought Shanahan, Andy's last drive was classic Andy. I thought Shanahan, you're 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 a Niners guy. I thought he had a good day. I think there's some limitations to Purdy. Obviously, Spags felt every time he had to make a stop, you put pressure on him. It's almost the opposite of what you do with Mahomes, where you never blitz. With Purdy, there's a pretty clear way to defend him in big situations. Go right at him. He's small, uh, doesn't have a huge arm. But your takeaway on Shanahan's afternoon, because he'll get pinned with a loss. Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought he had a rough stretch in the third quarter where he got a little pass happy uh, that yeah. they had the lead. I, I think the game early on, the Niners were out playing them, right? Their defense hadn't looked like that in months. months. And they were coming. And instead of being up, like when they were rolling during the season, 17 to three or something, they were up a touchdown. They're up 10 to three. And it's just... You're like you're you can't keep this guy in the game, and it obviously played out that way as it went. Uh, Spagnola and that defense is fantastic, but yeah, I, I thought you know the big question mark for me coming into the game was the 49ers defense and specifically their defensive line, and they were yes. awesome today. Yes, I, I, Bosa, I would imagine Bosa could have been MVP at halftime. He was incredible. Uh, he was. Everyone was so tired by the end, right? And I I would imagine by the time everyone wakes up in the morning, one area of controversy I know in Ninerland is going to be his decision in overtime now with these new rules uh whether to take it he wins the toss and he and he he elects to take the ball now during the season the 49ers whenever they win the toss they defer I, I actually was okay with it because if you kick it off and they go down and and score that is so much pressure on Purdy and I thought Purdy on that first overtime drive was incredible. I had the play he yeah. made to Christian McCaffrey, yes. the other play he made to use check. But what happened? A couple big time third downs in the red zone, Spagnola in that defense, specifically Chris Jones. I mean, yeah. he was unblockable at points. And, you know, Purdy, they just got to him and he basically had to throw it away. And then that last drive by Andy. I mean, I I think when you look at this game, it is a legacy definer by Jordan Pippen and Phil Jackson, a.k.a. Andy Reid, Kelsey, and Mahomes now. That's a devastating loss. I mean, how many times, you know, it's not like the 49ers are showing up to these Super Bowls and getting their ass kicked. I mean, they're losing in devastating fashion. Now, I guess you tip your hat because you're losing to Mahomes and Andy, but, man, that is a – that's a gut check. But, I Yeah, that's, that's tough to shake right now, Colin. Yeah, and here, let's, let's face it. I lost a lot of money on the Niners. I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> let's, let's face it. Eli Manning beat Brady twice in these games, and Eli made the throw. Mario yeah. Manningham and David Tyree. Um, Purdy missed a touchdown in this game. Chris Jones, remember that? I, I don't know where I had it written down. I think it was third or fourth quarter, but Purdy had a big miss. Uh, Chris it, Jones uh, right kind of in his face coming over, and he kind of had to go yeah, to the left. Yeah, and so I think there was a couple of moments in this game where, you know, you didn't blitz Brady. You didn't blitz Mahomes. The, the great ones, you don't even screw around with that. The way to stop Purdy is blitz. And that that tells you what people think of him, which is he's a little small. You could see a couple of times. You get pressure on him. He, he's pretty average arm. Um, I thought he was pretty good today, Colin. I, no, I, I thought, did overall. I thought he was I, I pretty thought he, good. I thought he had a good game. I mean, I, I, I was much more nervous for his performance. Thought it was going to be rocky. I thought for the most part, he, he was... He played a winning football game. Uh, th there were some plays at the end where, you know, he just gets hit. Like you said, I mean, he, he's not going to break Chris Jones's tackle, but I, I thought for the most part, he was pretty damn good. He's not Mahomes, and that's been the whole argument. He's not. I mean, this 
Are, are we watching? I mean, the conversation now, this guy's got his third Super Bowl. And I mean, what a remarkable final drive. Yeah, I think, you know, as I as I go back and forth on this, I thought when it was 0-0, zero, zero, after the first quarter, I thought, boy, this is not good for San Francisco. They have thrown Kansas City around the field. Um, my second takeaway, I was Bosa should be the MVP. Um, my third takeaway in the game is, you know, Shanahan is just, he's getting the ball to Christian McCaffrey. They couldn't get it to Kittle, but he was getting it to Christian McCaffrey a lot. And then I felt like the fourth thing that I wrote down, I thought Kansas City in the third quarter, I felt like they gained some momentum. Yeah, I thought San Francisco did. got a little pass happy. I thought they started, Pacheco started to get some runs. Um, I mean, overall, when these games come down, you know, Manning beat Brady because he made two huge throws. These games are, these iconic games like this, they come down to a play. I thought the officials pretty much stayed out of it. Um, I I thought, by the way, I thought uh, Moody uh, was remarkable. I thought, you know, I went into the game and my take was, uh Purdy and Moody against maybe the best kicker and the best quarterback. That's a huge disadvantage. But, you know, Moody's hitting 53 yard field goals. <laughs> I know. And I thought yeah. one of the things I thought Brock Purdy did very well, and I wrote this down, I thought in the first half, I figured he'd you'd come back down to earth, but I thought he could be nervous. I thought in the first half, he played with a ton of composure. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I remember Brady Super Bowls where he's sailing things and Peyton Manning Super Bowls. I was kind of shocked at the composure. Now, some of it was play calling. They set him up to succeed on some stuff. But nonetheless, um, it's it's one thing to lose to Mahomes last time. But I felt in the fourth quarter, Kansas City was the better team. There was never really a point in this game. I felt Kansas City was superior. When that game came down to fourth and two and Mahomes scrambled, I was thinking, if they don't get it, that's a fitting end. San Francisco just felt that what makes this hurt is I think San Francisco had a great game plan. Purdy played well. Moody was sensational. The defense dominated. Line of scrimmage. This one felt like you outplayed them and lost. They, they did all season long when the Chiefs have won, and including the playoffs. They've played it on their terms in a lower scoring game. And when the Niners have won throughout the season, when they kicked the Eagles' ass, when they kicked the Cowboys' ass, and last week when they came storming back on the Lions, they score a lot of points, right? So, and this score was a little higher because of overtime, but it was in the teens the entire second half, right? That's how Kansas City's very comfortable. I, I went to cocktails on Thursday night with a buddy who's been on the staff for the whole run of this Chiefs team. And he said, because of it, because of Mahomes, no one gives our defense the credit they deserve. This is by far the best group we've had. Yes. And it's all young players and their physicality and their secondary physicality, how well they tackle. What do the 49ers hang their hat on over this run of Shanahan? Breaking tackles. They take slants. They take crossing routes. They turn a seven-yard gain into 28. They turn a 20-yard gain into 60 yards. That never happened tonight because they tackle so well. That physicality, for the first time, and this is not going to change next year because all these guys are coming back, the Chiefs now have one of the all-time greatest players in the history of the game, a coach who now has no pressure with three Super Bowls, and a defense lighting people up. Yeah. So their defense, and the 49ers were playing that way too, but the Chiefs can match that. That They would not have been able, they couldn't play like this a couple years ago. And yeah. now they, they not only can play like this, they're comfortable playing like this. So the Niners, and this is where I think they benefit from those close calls, they were comfortable in a weird game. They, they never, you know, they like you said, Purdy kept his composure. Kyle kept his composure. Kyle stayed late on an aggressive fourth down call late in the game. Yeah. And I think he knows. He learned last time you can't be that way against Andy Reid. But, you know, the, the Chiefs' physicality in, in both these two teams, I, I think it's credit to we talk so much about teams not practicing through the season. You know, the Eagles got crushed for doing walkthroughs in December. To have that type stamina, both these two teams, playing like an extra – you know, a full extra quarter going full go in the Super Bowl. I, I think that's a testament to the way these teams practice. It shows by the way they play, physicality. It, listen, I, I know everyone's a sucker for touchdowns. I enjoy physical football. I enjoy an old school game. I was glued. Now, granted, I was on the Niner side, a lot of money, but that that was that was a fantastic football game. Like, well, I, I, I can live with the punts and the defense. Like, I enjoy yeah. that. Yeah, I thought the second half and overtime were – um that's as good as football gets in America. You were getting a crucial quarterback play, clever play calling, um, you know, big 
third and fourth down plays. You know, and and one of the things I had said, you know, Kansas City, I mean, you go back to week eight, I was like, I, I, they're a playoff team only because the Chargers in Denver aren't any good. And then by week 12, you're like, kind of figuring it out. The last four games they played are the best four games they played all year. Yeah. And, and I mean, seriously, it's like, that's kind of the magic potion with them is that this, there's no reason. I mean, if you really think about it, they have kind of a weak number one receiver. Um, they're not as good at tackle as they'd like to be. Outside of Chris Jones, it's kids. But boy, do they draft. Boy, do they coach. Boy, do they develop. I mean, if you really look at this game, you know what I felt like for the first half? The experienced guys were beating the kids. I thought Kansas City looked a little nervous. The yeah. fumbles. You know, they just, and it was like, oh boy. I mean, Fred Warner. Oh, Bosa. Jesus. Christian McCaffrey. It kind of felt like. The grown-ups, it, like one of those NBA playoff games where you're like, oh, okay, here here come the old guys, the old warriors against the young Celtics. Here come the old guys. But again, you know, Spags has done this, John, all year. You can't score. You can't score on this team late. Wasn't that a big difference in the game down the stretch? There was a, on that final drive, Kyle had to call a timeout because he didn't like the defense that was being called. Because a couple plays before, they had all out blitz. They don't get there and they hit a huge play to Rice. You think Andy Reid is calling a timeout on anything Spags has to do? In fairness, I don't even disagree with Kyle doing it. But the difference of the cohesion of the coaching staff, both of them are the offensive play callers. Both of them are spending time with the offense. Yet one kind of had to micromanage a little bit, and the other guy has full belief because Spags is going to win more Super Bowls as a coordinator than anyone not named George Seifert. And, and you should have belief in him. And his play calls – or just perfect how well that defense played. But like you said, I, this isn't some indictment against Kyle Sucks. You know, I remember when I worked for the Eagles, Andy was kind of at that moment where he was like the back when Phil could never win a major or Charles Barkley. Or one, and you were one of the rare guys that defended him of being like, what are we talking about? Like, this guy's clearly one of the best coaches. It took him a long time, but it was pretty evident pretty early. I, Kyle's going to just, you get you get criticized when you lose these big games. Yeah. It's kind of the elephant in the room now, hanging over him, moving forward. Can he win this big game? I, I listen. I who I else th- would you rather have beside a couple guys in the league over that guy? No, I thought I re- I wrote it down two of my notes. I thought Kyle had a great. He had a little bit of a spell, like you said in the third quarter. But I mean, let's give. I think he was taught. Ty- if I was going to defend him, they were starting to play Christian a little well, and then you were getting into second and nine immediately. So it's one thing when you pop the big runs, and listen, I'm a proponent of run the ball, but if it's not working, then all of a sudden you put your second-year quarterback in second and nine. Their guys were jumping off sides. It was like second and 12 or third and 12, and I think he was trying to avoid that and get some easy completions. But back to what we said about the Chiefs defense, it's hard to get completions on them. And when you do, they tackle so well. So even if you get a three-yard little out route, they tackle you on the spot. DraftKings, the leader in fantasy sports, just dropped a brand new fantasy game called Pick 6. It's the newest way for you to get in on fantasy football action with DraftKings Sportsbook. Just pick between two and six NFL players and predict if they're going to have more or less of a stat. For example, a player will have more or less than 100 rushing yards or more than one touchdown. Okay, track your lineup, compete against others, for a shot at a huge cash prize. Fantastic. DraftKings Sportsbook, official sports betting partner of the NFL. Sign up now. Takes 90 seconds. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. The code is Colin, C-O-L-I-N. The crown is yours. It'll be interesting going forward um, with San Francisco. Kittle got banged up. Debo again. Uh, McCaffrey is, uh, he's, I, I'm telling you, uh, uh, Walter Payton, Barry Sanders, McCaffrey, I think is the third best running back I've ever seen. Yeah. How how fast was he on the sideline on that on that play? Um, I think it was an overtime to set up the field goal. How kind of juked fa- him out, got to the corner. He's I mean, he's a remarkable. I mean, player. he's he just ran past a corner, flew yeah. past him. It's interesting though because you know they hit on Ayuk. They've got the kicker, a quarterback. Purdy's going to be around. Both um, special. They Trent Williams, you 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 are a little long. You also can't pay two linebackers big money. They've got some decisions to make. Um, like I we I think we all know Kansas is going to be back and better the next year. They just have to find yeah. a number two receiver. They're, they're going to be fine. 
Um, San, what do, when you look at San Francisco, do you, um, you know, they're not paying Purdy anything. Will they have to move off anybody? What do you think? Who, what do they draft? Where do they I, have I, to get I, a I, corner? I, I think Kittle, Kittle's, you know, getting up there in age now, makes a lot of money. You start investing in Brandon Ayuk. It's one of those things, you know, Kittle doesn't impact the game like Kelsey now in the passing game consistently. He's important to the run game. But once you start taking 15, 16, $17 million cap hit, Kyle, for being an offensive guy, wired like Andy Reid, they like investing in the line of scrimmage. Their offensive line needs to improve. They could always he'll keep investing in the defensive line. Uh, Eric Armstead's another guy that makes a lot of money who's up there, but he's team captain. You know, they, these are complicated decisions. And this is where if you want to sustain success, whether you're winning Super Bowls like the Chiefs did when they traded Tyreek Hill, or like San Francisco now, it's proven that you got to make tough decisions. And no one was better at it than for 20 years than Belichick, right? And the media always used to crush them. How can you trade this guy? It's like, we don't have unlimited money in a salary cap league. So you got to make some tough decisions. And the 49ers are definitely going to have, I mean, Dre Greenlaw, poor his Achilles running out to the field. Now he's a guy under contract, doesn't make that much money, but he's pretty important for them. And uh, one thing that I I think both teams showed, and that John Lynch is really good because Kyle plays a big role and Beach obviously is a stud. They have, both teams have good depth. That they're they're very very good at developing players over the course of the season. I mean, how good was Jawan Jennings today? This oh, is a seventh. This is a seventh round player, and he's been making big plays for them for three years. So, being around the Niners at practice and knowing Coach Reed, a lot of similarities that young players get better. And one thing they really have on their side, which if you're going to get a legit starting quarterback making under a million dollars, I'm sorry, that's the best contract in the NFL. So you still got a couple years to work with that. And I, I think as long as you have that in your back pocket, that, that's a that's a pitch most teams don't have. I mean, think about right. the other teams in the NFC. The AFC is harder, even though the Chiefs have proven like they're unfazed by it. Dallas, a lot, lot of question marks with the Cowboys, right? Mike McCarthy, last year coaching. Eagles have a ton of question marks. They're hiring two coaches that have never worked with Sirianni. If they start slow, Kellen, a lot of weird stuff going on. Lions are pretty good, but I mean, let's... <laughs> Yeah. That's the first big game Dan Campbell's ever won. So they they got a long way to go to they could keep doing this. The Rams are coming, but Stafford's getting long in the tooth. Aaron Donald's getting old. The yeah. NFC to me is dramatically easier, right? I mean, the Ravens are going to be good. Burrow's coming back. Uh, Harbaugh now with with the Chargers. Um, it just you you would imagine Miami gets better on defense. Yeah, but I I think the the road to the playoffs and in before the Super Bowl for San Francisco is dramatically easier than it would be in the AFC based on the quarterbacks you have to go through. So that that's another thing that benefits them. And I mean, who's the beside McVay and Kyle? Like, what are we talking about, right? In the uh, Sirianni, I, I like Dan Campbell, but no one, no general manager no, in the taking Dan Campbell over Kyle Shanahan. Yeah, I mean, I if uh, to me, I think the Packers, I would pick the Packers to win the division over Detroit just because I think Jordan Love had huge growth and that team is stacked with young they're, players. They're a team too. I forgot about them. They're yeah. coming. Uh, Rams, I think if they have another good draft, I mean, they just, McVay and Shanahan, you know, those are wars. Those are cerebral yeah. wars, academic, physical wars. You know, I, I want to go back to um, so much of when the Patriots were dominating. You know this. It was Ernie Adams, Dante Scarnecchia. Belichick, Brady, and then Josh. two other players, Gronk, and maybe a Vince Wilfork. You know, they had kind of interchangeable corners. Um, you know, they moved around pass rushers. But when you you start stacking up Brett Veach, Andy Reid, Mahomes, Kelsey, and Chris Jones, and that shit is, I mean, there's those are A pluses. Chris Jones, his intensity on the sideline when uh MVS ran backwards. Yeah. I mean, that guy is so locked into everything. Um, and there's only two or three defensive linemen in my life, like like Reggie White, Aaron Donald. I don't think Chris is that level, but it does feel like to me, John, in these big games, Chris is virtually unblockable. I, I mean, I, I today I'm watching that game and I'm like, this is Aaron Donald against the Bengals. You have to double him. You can't single him. I mean, I... You know, he's the, not, the Niners he, don't exactly have Jim Otto and Larry Allen playing guard and center for him as, as part of the problem, too. So, so it's he, a huge the, advantage for the Chiefs. They only him. signed him, John, to a one-year deal. I know they probably wanted to move off him. Boy, he'd be a hard move for me. I mean, I, I feel like he's the soul of that defense. I, I think it's very difficult, but I, I, I do think 
the money that some of these teams that are desperate <clears throat> that they're going to throw around. And this is where this would be his third contract with them. This is the Belichickian type move. And Belichick could pull these moves off once he had one ring, two rings, now three rings. Let's face it, Andy and Veach, now with Patrick by their side, have so much equity, they can kind of do whatever they want. And when they did it two years ago and they traded Tyree Kill, it looked crazy. Like, you're trading this guy who's gone on to have, I mean, two of the best years he's ever had in Miami. All-time right. great player. And they've won two Super Bowls since. So I'm with you. It's impossible to replace that, right? That They hit, they struck oil in the second round and got a Hall of Fame player. But one thing with Belichick, beside the quarterback, when it came to the big, big money, that third contract, I mean, you're talking a defensive lineman, right? A hundred plus million dollars guaranteed. Yeah. Kelsey's getting longer in the tooth. You're going to have to pivot on some offense. They they definitely could improve offensive line. Thune's hurt. He's a highly paid guy. You never might have to move off him. So I, if I was a betting man right now, I yeah. think when you win the Super Bowl, it helps make a very tough decision. They tra- When they traded Tyreek, Andy Reid would have told everyone that he knows that I, I know I'm trading a great player, but this is a financial pie that we have to build. And look at what they did. They got a first and second round pick. How good is McDuffie? I mean, is that like a Charles Jesus. Woodson hybrid? How good is that guy going to be? So That'd this be is great. And, and this is why when you have a great GM that when you can make a tough move, I, I don't know if they can, I, I forget if they can franchise and trade him or not, but even if he goes, you get a comp pick. Veach has proven Parlovskis. I mean, all over the place. In that draft two years ago when they traded Hill, their first two picks in the first round, their pick and the Tyreek Hill pick, McDuffie and Karlovskis. And those guys were all over the place. I mean, McDuffie has a chance to be one of the better DBs in the league because he can yeah. cover, he can blitz, he's physical. And th- th- these guys, they get to the point, once you're really in your prime with your quarterback, and Bill was like this for a long time, is Andy now knows every player in the league, right? He's literally evaluated every guy in the league. And then he gets a GM and a personnel guy. And that's the one thing Bill, once Pioli left, he had Casario for a while. Like Veach isn't going anywhere. So they're such in lockstep on exactly what they're looking for. Mahomes is in the boat with him, a lot like Brady, right? But it's their relationship's even better because like Andy would go to dinner with Mahomes or, or Bill right. would not with Brady. Their, their relationship is much more in a friendly manner, professionally and personally, that I think you can make tough decisions. And I'm, I, let's face it, you win this third Super Bowl. What can Andy well, do besides getting rid of Mahomes that anyone's going to question? Well, and also I think Chris Jones can say, hey, listen, I got another ring. I'm going to go get paid. Yeah, I'm I've got play. three. <laughs> I'll go to Jacksonville, Tampa, no state tax. I don't, I don't $120 million dollars guaranteed. Yeah. Know. And, and I, I never, once a guy gets rings in the NFL, I get it. Especially when you're playing one of these life altering positions like D line or O line, where it takes years off your life. I mean, you come out with six shoulder surgeries, your hands are mangled. Just go get your money. Like take care of your family, your mom, your dad, that kind of stuff. So I think, you know, I, there'll be so many different headlines in this game. Usher didn't do a thing for me. I felt it was like late. It was like 28. Uh, that was that was my childhood. I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like pregame show uh, commercials, Usher second half. Unbelievable. The, um, you know, one of the bigger headlines. Um, and I, and I think I thought, I guess my take on Purdy is this. I thought he was really composed in the first half, like over. I thought he was kind of blew me away. I did think that there is a way, you know, people say there's a way to defend Lamar, put pressure on him. Well, there's a way to defend Purdy. It's pretty obvious. Now, Spags is great. So it's not like Purdy struggled against, you know, this is a great defensive coordinator. Fantastic. And I'll say this. I think Didn't Kansas, turn the ball over. Almost did at the end. Yeah. But. Yeah. I think, I think this defense by Kansas City is fast and twitchy. And I think people will now acknowledge, holy shit, it's really good. Um, but Baltimore kind of ate Purdy up a little bit. Um, I think Purdy played too well in this game for him to get a lot of heat. But the talk tomorrow will be, well, you know, you settle for a field goal. Mahomes gets a touchdown. Do you think Purdy will get any heat at all? No, I think it's more on Kyle. I, I, you know, you're making 900 grand. I mean, Kyle's making 15 million. He's the star of the show. One thing I, if I wanted to criticize Kyle, the play caller, and I think you see it with Andy, when part of the thing with Kyle is his offense is his offense, where Andy has adapted over the years a million. Yeah, he yeah. plays one way with Alex, he plays another way with Mahomes. Yes. Yes. He used to pass probably too much. Now he has no problem running the ball. He, he realizes he's got that Belichick mindset of like, I'll do whatever it takes. 
where Kyle's offense is his offense. Yeah, and yeah. one thing they do not do beside the play action rollout is just like a rollout, snap the ball to him and get Purdy on the move. One of Purdy's defining characteristics, which no one really knew when he first started playing, which is evident now, is his mobility is pretty damn yes. good. Yeah, And Kyle doesn't ever get him on the move. What happened some multiple times? There was a play early in the game, a throwback to Kittle that was negated with a penalty. Get him moving. He's an instinctive player. But that's not Kyle's offense because he doesn't have – Kyle does not have a drop-back passing offense. It's all tied to the run. Yes, And even when he gets pass happy, it's still run fakes to the pass or a quick screen fake. That's part of Kyle's deal. And I wonder if he just adapts a little bit moving forward next year with Purdy because their team's still going to be really good. They'll probably be the betting favorite after the draft to win the NFC. But I do, I mean, you know, Andy only got there once with Philly and he lost it. He lost a lot of the championship games. And then next time he got back with Mahomes, he won it and the rest is history. Now he's winning it. Kyle's been there twice now and lost in th- this one in <laughs> the longest overtime in league history, I and, would imagine. And in both games, outplayed Mahomes for at least three quarters. I was felt playing out- winning football. Was play- no it's one question. thing if you get it's one thing if you're the Denver Broncos playing that Seattle team, get your ass kicked. What are you gonna do? You know, it's just like damn, we were not you, you have these type games. I don't know how he sleeps for a week because he, he's been around this long enough to know how hard it is to get back. Listen, I, I think they're gonna stay maintained being pretty good, but how many opportunities do you get where your team comes out ready? They had just looked pretty shitty the last couple of playoff games outplaying them, even in overtime, you drive first and score. If you could just somehow get a stop, maybe get them to miss a long field goal, and what happened? Mahomes makes a couple plays. Andy makes a couple great play calls. All of a sudden, they get a wide-open touchdown. It just ends. And I, I think one of the question marks, I would imagine in the Bay Area, that that where Kyle had to call the timeout with Wilkes, this is the thing. And we, we've been talking about it for a while with Spags and, and Andy. He doesn't have to worry about Spags getting a job. He's going yeah. nowhere. So he has yeah. full trust in a great coordinator where Kyle lost back-to-back coordinators who he knew he felt comfortable with. And now he had to go outside and clearly like Wilkes is solid. Like he was good tonight. Not, but this is not exactly the 2019 Kansas city. You know, does Kyle think he's great? No, but it, you know, you're kind of in no man's land with this guy as a defensive coordinator. He's not some great defensive coordinator. No. If they were all available, he's not a top 10 pick in the league. So right. th- th- that to me is one question mark with the 49ers moving forward is how much trust Kyle has in his defensive court. And there was a point this year where they lost three straight games. I thought he was going to get fired, Yeah, but they didn't really have anyone else on the staff. And then when you have to, how often does an offensive coach who's the head coach call a timeout because he doesn't like the look on defense after he gave up a blitz. It's, it's very, very rare. And even Romo's like, he probably did the right thing, but it's not like Andy doesn't even have to do that. And uh, I think, I don't know. Maybe they just they would have ran out of gas even if you know Bill Belichick was their defensive coordinator. Yeah, I I, I thought Romo brought up a good point in the second half. I thought they were good that. tonight. I know they take a lot of shit, but I, I, I thought they were fine. I, I thought they were really good. I thought Romo had a couple of gems, and he kept saying this this Niner drive. He goes, this Kansas City defense, they've got to be tired. Now they're young, and young players usually, you know, San Francisco had multiple guys get dinged up, hit the ground. It's an older team, but I thought Romo pointed that out. You know, I had said this about Andy Reid. If I look at Bill Belichick's career, it is overwhelmingly tied to one player. I mean, they were bad in New England before Brady. They were bad after him. weren't very good in Cleveland. I, you know, I'll say this. I, the We don't consider Bill Russell with 11 rings better than Jordan with six. I think Mahomes is the best quarterback I've ever seen. I think Andy Reid's the best coach I've ever seen. He's not tied. He Donovan McNabb was a B minus quarterback. He, he was always inaccurate. He was an athlete, not ideal size. You know, he's always he short hop stuff. He he was kind of like uh, he was a good quarterback. He was out of shape in the Super Bowl, Colin. I mean, yeah. he was throwing up in the Super Bowl. <laughs> I mean, I just feel like Andy, who always gave Belichick problems, even with second tier quarterbacks. I think Andy's a better coach than Belichick. First of all. When that when you go to overtime, we're all just. I mean, Romo and Nance are like, "Oh, this is Andy Reid. This is this is this is almost unfair." I mean, Andy hides stuff. Um, so much of New England's success was tied to an offensive line coach. Um, I mean, if you go look uh, when Scott Pioli leaves in the last eight or nine drafts, when Bill controlled him, he didn't draft well. He's tone. He's allergic to offense. Once he lost offensive people, Bill really. St- regressed badly. 
I think you look at Andy Reid's coaching tree, his ability to adapt, win with multiple quarterbacks, multiple coordinators. I think Andy's the best football coach since Bill Walsh. That's my take. You know, again, Bill Russell had some advantages. Um, you know, it was Red Arbach. It was, there were fewer teams. And Bill, I, I'm not and in no way saying Bill, um, I mean, listen, he he helps find Dante Skarnecchia. He, you know, helped he drafted Brady. I think, but I think Andy Reid, I mean, we think Shanahan is elite. We both do, top three or four coach in the yeah. year. That game comes down to that last drive. I mean, you you have to acknowledge that Andy's doing stuff. They're hiding stuff they haven't used. I don't know. I, I when I watch when I watch Andy Reid's teams in big games. I mean, he's the best coach off a of bye of all time. He's now very close to being the best big game coach ever. Uh, they win more close games, more more games they've trailed in the half. I'm not in any way discounting Mahomes' ability, but shit, that last drive in overtime, it is so clever. Um, I mean, how many third and twos and fourth and twos did they run a play and you're like, oh, they haven't seen that one this year. I don't know. Where do we classify Andy Reid? Yeah, I mean, I, I think he's definitely, you know, Walsh is going to go down as probably the most famous coach of all time right there with Lombardi, right? When you when you close your eyes, you say the NFL, you'd go Walsh, Lombardi, and you said Belichick too. You know, Walsh won three Super Bowls. People forget Seaford won two, right? right. Uh, so – Andy now has three. One thing that's not debatable with him and Bill, because I, I do think Bill has taken some un, unfair criticism. Like we watched him make incredible moves in the biggest games from yeah. double passes to not calling the timeout against Pete Carroll to embarrassing Sean McVay, who granted was like 34 at the time, but still they, they, they scored three points in the Super Bowl. When their teams are not Super Bowl contenders, right? And Andy's proven it with, he was making the playoffs with Jeff Garcia. He had Alex Smith competing to win that division when Peyton Manning was in it. You remove Tom Brady, the team is horrendous, awful. And I would say if you just factor in the errors, eras, and you've talked about this, Belichick in an era where defense is physical is the cream of the crop, right? He was developing defensive game plans for Parcells to take out Walsh in Montana. Early on in Brady, he had those physical teams taking out Marshall Falk in the Super Bowl, some of the great game plans. Th that league no longer exists. The right. league we're in now is Kyle Shanahan, Sean McVay, Andy Reid. Offensive league, innovative. How to get first downs is just, if not more important than defense. And Andy's the best. It's not even close. And I think anyone that knows him, and, and I knew him before he had a Super Bowl, uh, I he's just an incredible human being. You know, that's one thing. People defend Belichick that have been around him because they had a lot of success around him. People defend Andy that have been around him before he won it because they liked him. Because what he, the way he treated people, the way he acted in the office, the way he was to coaches, look at his coaching tree. Like, if you factor that in, one thing Bill Walsh got a lot of credit for, right, was won Super Bowls, always pivoted off players, and found guys like, I don't know, Mike Holmgren, George Seifert, who then led in, they, they had this, you know, kind of uh, opening with what came with coaches that became, ran the league. Bill, Bill was the opposite. Right, look at Andy's coaching tree. It's freaking incredible, and all those guys swear by him. Yeah, Matt Nagy's considered a miss. In a time when Stafford, Rodgers, and Kirk Cousins were in their prime, he got he got Mitch Trubisky to the playoffs twice. <laughs> Mitch Trubisky is one of the. I, I think Mitch Trubisky was like the worst contract in the league. He made eight million dollars, and he's not even. He's barely a third string quarterback. Matt Nagy's yeah. gonna be head coach in the NFL again. Like I, I, I promise you, he he will be. You know who likes him the most on the staff beside Andy Reid? Patrick Mahomes. Like, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm giving that guy some credit of understanding what's, what can coach or not. Nobody, Bill Walsh would have struggled with Mr. Trubisky. How many games would Belichick have won with Mr. Trubisky? The guy, the guy can't hit water if he's sitting on a boat in the middle of the ocean. So, I, listen, I, I, I think Andy Reid, uh, the scary part is, Colin, he's just not done. Like, it, it, all this retirement talk, it, it, Andy's not a golfer. Well, Bill, he's not a fisher. <laughs> no, and also, to your point, they'll move off Chris Jones. They've got they've done a good job drafting Carl Loftus and some other players. They got some pass rush. So they'll move off Chris. Um, they'll probably try to get Kelsey to sign another deal. Um, but I mean, they're not, I mean, they're the smart teams in this league, I think, are they'll pay and they'll pay a front five guy, Aaron Donald, Rams, they'll pay him, uh, Chris Jones. But the smart teams in this league, this is what drives me crazy about Pittsburgh. You can't be spending your money on defense outside of a TJ Watt. 
you just got to go draft safeties and corners. And most of these guys, if you look at them, Kansas City, they're not drafting a corner. They'll Occasionally, if it's a big need, they'll go early. But a lot of them are fourth, fifth, and sixth round draft picks. Same with running backs. So I just think, I look at Andy and I think to myself, New England started to show signs of regression even after the Atlanta Super Bowl. It was very obvious they could not draft a receiver or a tight end after Gronk. You started seeing that at the end. Remember Brady on the bench screaming, get open. I don't know where Kansas City's organization has a whole draft, develop, communication, quarterback, defense, bags. I always felt you could really see the more power Bill got, the worse the drafting got. It wasn't even an argument. I mean, like Beach is hit. Like he's like uh, Brad Holmes in Detroit. You go to the last three years, you got like six hits. In the late rounds, know. too. It's not even just the first rounds. He's getting Pacheco's yeah. a seventh rounder. Watson, uh, the DB, I think, was a seventh rounder. So they're getting players all over the draft. Yeah, they don't really have. I mean, they really don't. They, they've they got the uh, they've got the ability to move off really popular, talented guys, which, you know, a lot of organizations don't. They can't they just can't move off them. Uh, I, I, I think, I mean, if I, if I, I'm, I'm trying to think my next year Super Bowl bubble, I thought this was, I honestly, I thought this was the year to get Kansas city. Yeah. <laughs> I thought really last did. year was two and they've won two. I mean, I, I was thinking I've been watching, I'm almost 40 years old. So I, I remember watching sports for 30 years, right? The Cowboys in the mid nineties had a great run. The Yankees, obviously the bulls, you know, the Patriots had a couple iterations, this five year stretch by the chiefs three Super Bowls, been to another and lost it, been to six straight AFC championship games. It's as good of a run. Yeah. Some of the Warriors, and the difference of the Warriors, I mean, they got Kevin Durant, so of course they weren't going to lose. Some of those Yankee teams, they, they had unlimited money. They were buying players. The way they've done it, this is a lot very similar to the Patriots. They made some tough decisions. It was coaching, development, led by star quarterback, led by intelligence, led by character. The other thing at, at with my guy on the Chiefs, and this is where I think the two teams have a lot in common, the character on these teams, how hard these guys work, how into football they are, how much they care about football, uh, how serious they take this. Like, th this is not some screw around. Half the teams in the league, I mean, some of their best players are not dependable guys on a seven-day-a-week basis. That is not the case with the Kansas City Chiefs. It's not the case with the 49ers. It's why these teams are kind of consistently winning, right? And obviously the Chiefs have that added element with Mahomes, which is kind of their trump card right now. But the football character that was on display in this game was something I would imagine every GM, when they go in a couple of weeks, the combine is going to go. You start interviewing these guys because it is easy. It's like, well, look at how many plays this guy can make. Well, he's got about seven red flags. His offensive coordinator in college wasn't a big fan. And they don't overlook that stuff. Or right. they make sure that, like, that's a non-negotiable because you get in the fourth quarter in overtime in your 21st game of the season – if you're not locked in, if you're not into it, if you haven't been training all year long, you have no shot. You, you have no shot. And that's the one thing Andy, you know, who's always been, he had a little Al Davis to him at, at moments in his career. They, they are not screwing around in Kansas City with guys that just are like that. I mean, they, they do not have a guy on the team who's some huge red flag. And the other thing is they get guys from culture. Look at MVS as a good example. Came from the Packers. Had played in a lot of big games. Yeah, he had some drops. Now, granted, they didn't have a lot of other options. And they said, Tony, they, they took a flyer on that, right, a couple years ago because they were pretty desperate. Where's Tony now? Nowhere to be seen. Yeah. Like, oh, we're just done. You're saying all this moronic stuff. You're dropping. See ya. <laughs> You're not even, we're not even giving you a helmet anymore, right? Yeah. And, and they just pick, a lot of teams would struggle because they need that speed. He's definitely one of the more talented players. You talk to them, they say, you should see this guy in practice. I can't trust him. And in a game like today, uh, listen, because you're going to have Christian McCaffrey had a fumble today, right? You're, yeah. you're going to have great players are going to screw up. But yeah. can I trust you in the biggest moments? And I thought today, for the most part, that why I like this game so much, all the best players were making plays. Guys that had developed over the years were making plays. And both coaches, both coaching staffs, beside a couple little things by the Niners, were pretty excellent. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things I feel bad because I have a friend, um, you're obviously, you have connections to the Niners. I have a couple of friends that are big Niner fans. And This one hurts, Colin. This one hurts. I know. It does. Because you outplayed them. You were the better team for most of the game, I thought. Um, you got mahomes -ed. You know, you got tigered <laughs> when he yeah. went through that 10-year. You know, you know, he just did it. He what are you going to do? What are you going to do? He's hitting irons out of the rough. 
280. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, what are you going to do? So I, I kind of look at um, the thing that can't be overlooked. I thought Fred Warner was spectacular. I thought yeah. Bosa was spectacular. I thought McCaffrey was spectacular. Um, I know it's really painful, but I thought Moody. I mean, it's. I know it. You just say it's a game, but when you draft him as high as you do, you know, some real. Pushback. He had two fifty plus yard field goals. I mean, going into the off season, John Lynch is is validated. Feel very it's good like, about it for sure. Yeah. So I think the way Purdy played, the way Moody kicked, um, you got to feel good. I mean, God, it's just. I'm not sure if I've ever felt worse for a Super Bowl losing team. Why well, R- Romo mentioned this on the broadcast that when they were talking to Fred, Fred says, I'm, I'm not just the heart and soul of the defense. I'm the heart and soul of the team. Like, I understand that that's my role. It was pretty telling when they went to overtime, you know, when the game starts, they send 17 players each out there for the coin flip, right? <laughs> eight chiefs, eight Niners in overtime. One of the great quarterbacks of all time goes out there and the 49ers send their linebacker. Right. And that's ideally you would send your quarterback as well, right? This is Peyton versus Brady or Rogers versus Brady. But, I mean, the Niners aren't going to send Purdy out there. So, and and that kind of, you know, at the end of the day, like, you would, you always want to be the team. Like, I don't blame the Niners for sending Fred Warner. He's on a Hall of Fame trajectory. He's an all-time great player. He's one of the great players in the history of the franchise. But, like, ideally in that moment, the heart and soul of your team, the heart and soul of the Patriots for, you know, 20-plus years was Tom Brady. Heart and soul of every Peyton Manning team was The Warriors is Steph. Yeah, and it's just, you send your, your linebacker. He can only do so much. And right. he was he made play after play. He was covering Kelsey one on one in the corner of the end zone with a game on the line. But I that that was and I, I don't expect them to send Brock Purdy, but that was a moment like this is we're sending one guy. This guy's carrying our franchise. You don't even I bet Kyle didn't even hesitate. Fred go, right? I mean, it's just you just know, right? You would send Michael Jordan, you would send Steph Curry, you would send Derek Jeter, and the 49ers sent a middle linebacker, just like the Ravens over the year. They would send Ray Lewis. Ideally, you send your quarterback. And that was the difference in the game is uh, Mahomes. I mean, on that fourth down when he kept it and Bosa went oh. on the run and he ran, it's like he doesn't get the credit for being this mobile guy. And then when he runs, you're like, well, he may not be as fast as Josh Allen, but he's not that much slower. You know, he's, he makes runs when you, cause he doesn't play that way that often. And That's he never, right. you know, with Lamar's running by guys, Josh is running over guys. He doesn't want to do that. He wants to throw, but when he has to, you go, Oh yeah, that's the athlete of a former big leaguer. Like you see, he's a, He's an elite human athlete, right? Yeah, you don't usually have a spy on Mahomes, but I almost think going – I watched this game today, and I thought you almost now have to have a spy on fourth down on Mahomes. Like that's just yeah. how you have to defend him. Just too often he takes it over. And I thought where, – where I thought Shanahan and Andy Reid were really good – is one of the things that will dry. And I try not to beat up on coaches for play calling. I don't know who's healthy. I don't know who's hurt. I don't know what the film says. Sometimes, you know, shit happens in the middle of a game and you just can't use somebody. What if your best play is against their best player? You know, you don't feel great about it. I thought both coaches in the biggest moments, McCaffrey, Debo, Kelsey, Mahomes, Pacheco, the coaching on display, Every time there was a big play, like the, the Tony Romo said it, you think they're not going to give it to Mahomes? He wasn't going to hand this to a seventh round running back, and we and Isaiah Pacheco is really good. But I, you know, I just I look at my notes and I sit down here and I think and I think, oh, my heart breaks for San Francisco. They they played so I I have these notes: Warner Bosa, Jesus, what a half! Bosa, first half MVP. Um, you know, it was ten three at half, and Kansas City only had one good drive in the first half. It was the last drive and they settled for a field goal. Um, that, not that I didn't, because I always think they make adjustments, but I did think after they drove down the field and they got a field goal, I'm like, I know they're only down 10-3. They got to move the ball on that first drive. Like they got to get field goal position back. I thought a big part of this game, I thought Kansas City felt like they were pinned. I, I thought two huge plays in the game because – the first series of the game, the 49ers drove the ball right down their throat. And you're like, they're going to score a touchdown. And then McCaffrey, who feels like never has anything wrong happen. Oh, that fumble. And then the Niners kind of thoroughly outplaying him throughout the game. And then the punt bounces off the dude's foot. And Ray Ray has to try to dive on it. And it just, and there was another fumble by a chief that went right into a chief. And there were yes. a couple little breaks that could have opened the 49ers and kind of gave them some breathing room that they definitely would have needed against Mahomes. That just didn't happen and went the other way. And and the Chiefs, 
I, I mean, have clearly proven that if you give them life and you do not separate, because 14 points, if you would have got up a couple scores against the Chiefs with the way the Niners' defense was playing, they would have been in good shape. But they could never extend that lead. And they had a couple moments where it's like, if you just make this an 11-point game, a 14-point game, this Chiefs offense is not good. That They are just a remarkable play caller and a great quarterback. And, and Kelsey can make a play here or there. But it's not like Kelsey had 10 for a buck 50 today. And they they couldn't do it. And one area all season long when the Niners will win a lot of their big games, they scored a lot of touchdowns. And I, I think it gets back to that inability to break tackles, the inability for big plays. I mean, they were pretty dependent on Jawan Jennings. Think about that. Like, it's not like Debo was going nuts. Kittle was borderline non-existent beside he, – he had one big catch, I think, on, on the fourth down. But they were very, very dependent on their third wide receiver, which to me, I'm not Belichick when it comes to X's and O's, but that has to speak to Spagnola taking away their main guys, you know, getting up there in Debo. De- Debo's not exactly Marvin Harrison as a route runner. Ayuk is, but they're, they're so physical at the line with their corners – that it's hard. And then Chris Jones getting so much pressure and he'll blitz. Purdy doesn't have that long to get him the ball in those deeper breaking routes. So they kind of got to want, I mean, think the, for the 49ers to score one of their touchdowns, they had to do, I mean, Kyle Shannon is not exactly a trick play guy had to do like a triple pass yeah, yeah. back to McCaffrey. So that kind of shows that, like you said, I, I don't think this chief's defense because of the play caller and the head coach, some of those great bill Walsh teams were all time great defenses, but no yes. one talks about them like that. Because you get overshadowed. Last I, I checked, Chicago Bulls, like one of the great defensive teams of all time. But yeah. all we talk about is the offense. This Chiefs team, and I would imagine Andy and Veach, and Andy doesn't drink, but you know when they're eating a cheeseburger and hanging out, I, they know how special that unit was because they were they were dominant this last month. I mean, dominant, dominant. I mean, and the linebackers again. You just don't know who they are, but they're they're. I would I think they have the best corners in the league. I think they have the best young linebackers in the league. They don't have a Fred Warner, or Roquan Smith. Um, I just all their I think D, all per- their D linemen play hard that you've never heard of, never heard of. So it is. Um, God, I love this game. It it is. Uh, you know, I was thinking about this. Is that streaming? Netflix takes over. Retail? Amazon takes over. Theme parks, Disney takes over. All those things were up for grabs at some point in the process, right? Like, um, it doesn't matter if it's banking or it's football. Is if you look at Brady, Belichick, Mahomes, and Andy Reid, is it's Tiger in his like twelve year run. Uh, Mickelson's got six more majors without Tiger. And before people say, well, Lamar, uh, Lamar can't do this, or uh, you know, Kyle Shanahan can't do this. We are looking, Brady and Mahomes have just put a lot of people on the shelf. I mean, think about this. What did Big Ben do his last eight, 10 years? Like he just disappeared into the ether yeah. and he had great defenses and great receivers. Levy and Bell is, I, I feel bad for the sport because, um, you know, like I watch Brady win so many close games over more talented Ravens teams or a more talented Bronco team or a, um, and, and well, I, I just, I look at this Kansas city team, it's almost discouraging because everybody around the team's going, well, shit, they don't even have a number one receiver. I mean, rice really, to me, feels like a great two, but can be a one. Um, I mean, it, if I said to you, like, I liked what Baltimore did this year. I don't know. I like I look at I look at football right now. It would not shock me if both of these teams are back. Big squishes average. You know, you know the thing I've always admired about Tom Brady, about Tiger in his prime, about great people in business is no matter how much money, no matter how much they success they have, the ability to like maintain the discipline of what got you there because the wind always blows the strongest at the top of the mountain, right? Yeah. And that's what Tiger and I would say Brady defined over their careers is their work ethic after unlimited money, unlimited success, unlimited fame. Everyone that were ever around him was like, they never, it was insane how hard they worked. And that gets back to Mahomes. Like I have seen it with Andy. He's the hardest working guy I've ever seen. He's like a machine, but it doesn't matter how most, a lot of coaches work hard. You have to have it in your players. And I think one thing when you have Patrick Mahomes, who's wired pretty clearly now, like he'd already won a couple, 
And the, the way he turned it on this season after kind of going through the mud against the Raiders on that Christmas Day game, I, I think was pretty definitive. This is the most incredible stretch of his career, right? Th this is the defining moment of we, we've seen all the crazy throws. We've seen the no look passes. We've seen the 50 yard bombs. We know he's a champion. But when you win it like this, when everyone's gunning for you, and, and for the first time, like a lot of obviously a lot of the money was on the Chiefs, right? I mean, the books took a bath today. They but the last beating. two games, a lot of people rightfully so. And I'm telling you, the Chiefs, I was told that they thought that that uh, Baltimore defense is the best unit that they had faced over this run. Top to bottom, just that defense, right? So th them getting past that group, it was like, obviously they knew the Niners were really good. I mean, they expected, they, they technically were the underdog in this game. But that ability to be unfazed, after winning a championship and to maintain that level of work ethic is how you like Michael Jordan just wanted more tiger. Well, wanted A lot of guys don't, a lot of guys are like, yeah, cool. I've, I've won. I'm, well, I'm super rich. Like shit. I'll just go kick it. You know, John, I was told this years ago. Um, how do you handle success? Everybody handles losing the same way. They're pissed and they work harder. They how do you, ha how do you handle success? A lot of guys don't handle it well. A lot of people, like in society, a stockbroker has a good year. He blows the money. You look up two years, he's just not putting the effort in. So to me, you've had success. Look at you. You work hard. It it drives you. Like a lot of people in, in my business, in football, they have some brief success and they they cash out. They get their Bentley. They get their second home. You know, they got $28 million in the bank. You're a football player. Take care of your mom, whatever really a defining the two defining characteristics of most great anything tiger mj is um a resiliency you know i tell my kids all the time go watch that michael jordan 10-part documentary best looking player best player best coach but uh, best number two robin it was hard he was battling his gm his owner dennis rodman it's hard he was getting tackled by the pistons uh and and the celtics resiliency. I mean, Mahomes has had to overcome um, two offensive line rebuilds. He's got father that's had some embarrassing public moments, a brother that's fairly high maintenance. I mean, people are a coming wife, out of, A wife who likes the limelight now? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So it's um, Mahomes has shown an amazing resilience to social life, uh, family life, fame is just incredibly resilient multiple rebuilds o-line receiving core he just can handle it and another thing is i mean he makes 45 million dollars a year endorsements i've been told more than that it used to be 20 years ago football players i remember watching donovan McNabb get a, a soup commercial i was like oh I've, I've never seen an nfl guy get a commercial yeah. uh outside of like a local truck dealer the guy's making 45 55 million a year in endorsements and it just it's just it's important to him. He wants to be respected. But I think he, the the two great things are resiliency and how do you handle winning? And, you know, you party, you have a great weekend, and then you get back to F and work four days later. And that seems, you know, you, there's this, I always hear this, oh, this toxic masculinity, this sort of toxic people who are obsessed with working. That's what all the great people do in every industry. It's just, it's a defining trait. Well, I, I get asked so much now that, I do this is like advice. And my number one advice always is you got to find what you like doing because you're going to end up working so much that it's so much easier to work hard when you like what you're doing. <laughs> and I think this speaks to why Patrick Mahomes, a lot of the great athletes, Mahomes, Brady, Tiger, they, they loved their sport. Andy Reid is a, if football was crack, he'd be a crack addict. He loves football. Like it's his life it means like Jim Harbaugh. Yeah, it, it's it's it, uh, most coaches, right? Kyle Shanahan, Sean McVay, they are addicted to football. You could not work the hours you have to work without loving it. That's why when I worked in the NFL, it's like you know I, I like other sports. I like doing other. I like business. I, there's other elements that I don't like it as much as they do. They Brett Veach is addicted to football, and I I, I think this speaks to when the combine comes around and the draft, the character of the guys, because. Do you think McDuffie's going to try any less harder? No, super high character guy. They know they feel very Kelsey all these years. But the Kelsey brothers are great examples. How much they enjoy playing football. Most of football is not the Super Bowl. It's for the next nine months, working out, OTAs, training, eating right, not doing things, turning things down because you got to you got to train, you got to work. You get such a small for all the money you have. You have ninety million dollars. That's the other thing. 
So he's making 45 on the field, 45 off. He's 27, 28. 99.9% of humans would take the foot off the gas. It's human yes. nature. It doesn't feel he's phased at all by it. And at a lot all. of these guys, I give a lot of you, Josh Allen, Lamar. I think it's impressive for all the top players in the NFL. Think I think it, the John. league, and I've always defended this, the percentage of guys that get in trouble, the, the league is full of the highest character, hardest working. If they weren't in the NFL, they would be so successful in whatever they were doing. I, I've thought about that. I've thought about that before. And most most poor leagues. But, but I mean, the, the, the NFL is very much a domestic league. How lucky is this league? It was such a great story. A seventh rounder and then Mahomes. How lucky is this league if you said, and I've defended Lamar Jackson on this, that kid gets so pissed when he loses. He wants yeah. it so bad. He wants it so bad. But think about the quarterbacks in the league now. The top ones, Josh Allen, Herbert, Mahomes, Lamar, Jalen Hurts. Like Burrow. Burrow, Trevor Lawrence. Like they're just great guys. And then- the Dad, guys cousins, that, that kind of crew. Like, like in and then then you get these stories like you know, Brock Purdy. There's so many different ways to be a quarterback in this league now. And and the, the great thing about Brock Purdy is that it will, it, he'll get guys drafted. I mean, people will start taking sixth and seventh round quarterbacks because you become it's like I thought Russell Wilson got Kyler Murray, Johnny Manziel, Baker Mayfield. It's like, yeah, they're a little short is that I think the league's really lucky. And now, and, and that's not to say the NBA has bad guys, but a lot of their greatest players, their more mature players are international players because yeah. they play with men. When these kids are like 15, 60, they play with men. You have to grow up very quickly. Our domestic players, it's more of an AAU, a little more juvenile basketball operation sure. than like international basketball. So many of the great players in the NBA, though great people, they're, they're international players. Our guys... You know, you watch them for three or four years. They come into this league. There's just not many. There's not many knuckleheads. There's no. good well, guys. You you get weeded out so fast because how hard it is. You, you really do because That's a good point. The, the majority of the week is not playing. Playing's easy. Like if baseball, you get to play every day. In basketball, you play every other day. Unless you're a star, then you play once a week. In football, you get one game, and that's the fun part. Ray Lewis, you pay me Monday through Saturday. Sundays are for free. The games are fun, but most of it is not. You're not just lifting. You're lifting hard. hard. The eating, the discipline of food. If you're a big guy, if you ever play with the older offensive linemen, you're like, wait, you played offensive line in the league. He weighs like 240. He's like, yeah, I used to have to eat 10,000 calories a day during training. Like, it's not easy to do that. Jason Kelsey is a good example. He's naturally probably 260 pounds, but he has to carry that 300. You have to maintain that with food. It's not always fun. Like, I like to eat, but not on that level. It's yeah. a very, very, and then the physical element of the sport. I mean, you just get, how many times a day? I know I held my breath half the Niners when they got tackled. Every time Christian McCaffrey goes down, I'm like, God, I hope he gets up. Debo Samuel, like, God, I hope he gets, because the collisions in this game. I, I saw Lewis Riddick talking about this this week. He said that, you know, back when they played in the, in the 80s and 90s of John Lynch days, it was obviously much more physical and much more reckless. But it was, guys weren't, the training was a lot different. You know, there was, drinking and it's just it, now you were much more likely to get killed nowadays the the training i mean all these guys are the lean muscle mass they have i mean they're just purely muscle and they've never been faster so if they didn't regulate the hits out of the game i, I mean you would have some serious injuries because there are collisions now I, I love physical football i grew up on that type of football and i miss it sometimes the game is still when it matters really physical the level oh, in which yeah. these corners and safeties all tackle they all wait for the combine. How many guys, how many DBs, wide receivers, running backs, and safeties don't run 4 4 or 4 5? If you run 4 5 5, we're like, hey, slow. <laughs> you know, <laughs> back in the day, a lot of guys playing in the NFL were running 4 7. That, that, that difference, when you factor in a little extra muscle mass and you're go running from 4 7 to 4 4 8, that collision hits a little harder. And I, listen, I, I, I miss those days, but I, I do think in the biggest, in the biggest games, this league is still about physicality and tackling. Yeah, let's, um, I thought, you know, it's one of the things about the NFL that I think you and I appreciate this is that um, I think it's a really well-run league. And I think it's easy. Uh, a lot of people in the media, a lot of newspaper people tend to be precious and they're, they're kind Goodell of anti- was getting crushed last week. 
I mean, it's getting destroyed. What are we talking about? People just don't understand. Everything is up. They handled, uh, you know, the Kaepernick situation. They, you know, not easy for like Black Lives Matter. Those are those are big social movements. Um, those are not easy to navigate. And I think about seventy percent of players, NFL players, African American. Uh, he's navigated that. Players like him. Corporations like him. Um, they're, you know, I, I know having talked to people at networks, they're tough. But um, rightfully I think, so. I mean, yeah. you got a product you want. But if you start looking at how smart they've been with moving, uh, extending the draft, moving free agency, putting stuff on Christmas. You know, I saw the NBA trade deadline was during a Super Bowl week. Well, what are you doing? What the, what the F are you doing? Baseball gives its awards like two months after the season. They don't give them on the same day. There's no buzz. Like it's all of a sudden out of the blue, you're like, oh, that guy won the American League MVP. You're like, and then four <laughs> days later, it's that guy won comeback player of the year. It's like, what are we doing here? The NFL has done a remarkable job to own the calendar. I mean, if I was baseball, the there's an opening. Sean McVay didn't play starters. It worked. Now nobody plays starters. The preseason's dead. NFL's cut a game. They may cut another game. It's just dead. Baseball, August is wide open. They'll never move on it. It's wide open. Guys like you and me, we take August off. It's like an off month. If if you shorten baseball by uh, 120 games and you start playoffs like August 8th, you own the month. That's what football would do. That's what he watched the NBA get this big marketing day when everybody's home on Christmas and Goodell's like, no, we're moving games. So when I look at the NFL, there's a lot of reasons it's popular, scarcity, gambling, um, but it's really, it's made everything else niche and they don't, they navigate politics. They're good to their players, but don't pander and coddle. Um, they've got mobility, but also loyalty. And I think they manipulate the calendar. And when I when I see these people get on Roger Goodell, I've had drinks with him once and dinner. He's really a good listener. He's just always, what do you think? I remember I had him on the show like several years ago. It was before the Super Bowl with New England and Philly. And I said, Commissioner, I love your sport. I don't know what a catch is. I don't understand what a catch is. And he literally said on the air, he goes, Colin, it's a big problem. That Super Bowl, they literally switched it from the Super Bowl. Remember, there were a couple of juggling catches yeah. by the Eagles in the end zone. They were touchdowns. And I don't know. I just, when I when I look at the NFL, in my business, you got to talk about it about 65% of the time. I think it's, I don't even know what the hole is. Like, I think it's a brilliant league and incredibly well run. You could argue that you could talk about it 80, 85% of the time yeah. and not skip a beat. I thought the criticism for him and a lot of big, big J's that were very, very angry at Roger holding this press conference. I think question like no one cares. The average fan does not care what Roger's saying. The other thing is no one associated with the NFL players, coaches, executives, owners, people like us that talk about it have ever had more success because of the popularity of this sport. Yet if you just pull the average person that writes about the NFL they would say Roger sucks. And on the on the flip side, they would say Adam Silver is great. And listen, maybe it goes back to he doesn't placate with them. He doesn't text many of them, maybe. I, I've never met the guy. I, I don't have any dog in the fight beside I like football. But the league, think about, how about this week is a good example. They were very, very against Vegas for a long period of time. My, my father worked for a big farmer back in the 70s that bought a Vegas casino. The Maxim. Do you remember that when you yeah, got yeah, there? Yeah, it had yeah. gone bankrupt and he had bought it. And when he bought it, the guy comes up to him and says, uh, Jack, we got three or four rooms with basically the equivalent of Joe Pesci, Robert De Niro, and Ray Liotta. They don't pay. I would just let them be. It was mob guys, right? Yeah. In Vegas forever, 70s, 80s was probably shady. You go there now, it's corporate America, S&P 500. It is normal business. And what have the NFL done? They shifted right there. And that's that Vegas Super Bowl should happen every four years, max. <laughs> I mean, you talk about a perfect place. It, it's it's made for that. And now they have the – how awesome did that Super Bowl look on television in, in that in, in that stadium? And, and they, they, they listen, they were very at, adamant anti-Vegas. Remember, Tony got in trouble. And then the laws changed, and they quickly pivoted, and they moved a team there, and they've never looked back. Yeah, I think um, – and that's what people I talk to. I, I have always um, been partial to Miami – 
um, because it's just such a walk around on Ocean Avenue and uh, Ocean Ocean Drive and the I think it's Collins Drive or whatever is behind it. Um, I love just walk. And it, it, by the way, it's 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 like South America. It's cold in the rest of the country. It's even cold in California, and Dallas, and then it's warm down in Miami. But I always thought Miami did the best job. And Los Angeles is more than capable, but LA is a big city and traffic's an issue. Um, traffic downtown, because of that F1 race, it really effed with traffic. Uh, Vegas has never had great traffic. But you know, the other thing is about the Super Bowl in Las Vegas, go look up the 20 biggest hotels in America. 18 are in Vegas. You go to these places like the MGM, the biggest hotel in most American cities may have six, 450 rooms. These things have like 8,000. I, I stayed on the 65th floor at the Cosmo. I mean, I, I don't know how many rooms the Cosmo has, but to do the math, I mean, it's got to be a lot. So the, the city's just uniquely built. You know, I, I've said this for years. We don't move around Mardi Gras, New Year's, Rock and Eve. We don't move around a lot of the, uh, the, the awards that we see on TV and radio. You don't have to move everything. I mean, this idea that we should have cold weather Super Bowls. You can't put a Super Bowl. We tried it in Jacksonville, for Christ's sake. I was there. They had to bring in ships. There was nowhere to sleep. I mean, they, they were have they were having local, they had to call in 3,000 taxi drivers from like Miami and Orlando. It was an S show. Put it in Vegas. If, if, I said the in Super, if I said the Super Bowl was there five straight years, would anyone complain? No. I don't think they would. It's it well, just, it, you don't never need to go outside. It's it just, it's uniquely equipped for that. Yeah, no, I I I thought Vegas crushed. Uh, I thought Goodell had another good year. Uh, they just navigate all the turbulence and social issues. Um, I I wouldn't be surprised if the same two teams are back. If okay, so let's do this. Let's. Uh, I thought Romo and Nance did have a good game. I, th you know, it's funny. Um, I don't. They're gonna move the deck chairs. I think the CBS pregame show. There wasn't a memorable moment. They're all nice guys, but I. I, it doesn't have a lot of oomph to me. It's kind of Fox has had that crew. It's like TNT basketball. It's just better than ESPN's. What are you going to say? It's Barkley at Shaq. It's Kenny attorney. I think the Fox crew has been doing it. You know, it's a little older in the tooth, but it's just good. It's, it's been good for a long time. It's smartly produced. Bill Richards. It's great pieces. Funny enough. Um, and the CBS crew's okay to me. Uh, NBC at night. Very okay to me. Oh, terrible. Yeah. I'm not a fan. Not you. But, um, I thought Romo and Nance were pretty good. I, I think Nance is great. And I think, you know, Tony is just kind of a squirrely fun personality. Tony's the kind of guy that if you went out golfing with him, you'd have a ball. He'd tell you a million stories. And sometimes he can be a little bit loose. But I thought he did. I thought he was. I thought it was one of Tony's, Romo's better broadcasts. I thought he started calling things very quickly. You know, one of the things he kept saying is, you know, he'd be like, oh, this, this drive hurts. Or uh, he kept saying, I thought it was really smart. He'd go, okay, that... Whatever you just saw there, that was a designed Shanahan play. He was calling that throughout the game. He would give the coach credit, not just the player. And that's important. There's a distinction there that we always give the quarterback credit. And he would say with like at the end, he's like, that's an Andy Reid play. Mahomes is great. That's an Andy Reid play. So I, I, what is your take? I, I think Nance and Romo are fine. I do think once he signed that $17 million a year contract, he became a target. And once you're a target, it's hard. I, I think he got pigeonholed in the lane if he calls the plays, which is not a sustainable thing to go, do. And I think it is hard to be the goofier guy if you're not a little older. You know, John Madden, when he started calling games, by the time I was a kid, was in his 50s, right, or 60s. Gruden was already this massive personality by the time he got the booth. When I think about Troy Aikman, I think a guy, like, he'll crush some people. Troy Aikman's kind of an old school bat. He has that definitive lane. People kind of like that. Because a lot of announcers, the former players, they won't really be critical. To Troy has no problem doing that. That's why I, that's my st I enjoy that. Yeah. Collinsworth is just one of those unique guys that I don't remember a play he ever made because by the time I was, he was already retired by the yeah. time I was probably 10, but he's just good. And you watch Tony sometimes, he gets loosey goose. Not really my style because he's never going to be that critical on moments where it's like, okay, Tony. But if you're not going to do that, you have to do something else. Yes. And he kind of lost his fastball once he stopped doing the plays and people thought he was starting getting lazy because what's he doing? He's never going, well, that's a terrible call when it obviously is. I think most people that sit on their couch now, we've all watched a lot of football. Some stuff's pretty obvious. Yeah. And when the announcers refuse because they're everybody's friends, they know these coaches, it's not that enjoyable, right? Why, why does Colin Coward have success? You're opinionated. There's, you see something, you say it. 
And I think Tony was very hesitant to do that. In fairness to Peyton Manning, he's like, listen, I don't want to be critical. So he doesn't call the games, really. He just does the thing with Eli. But if you're going to sit in that chair, if you're going to be Tom, it's going to be hard. Like, uh, Tom, people are going to want to hear you say, that's a terrible play call. Because we we watched you play, and we know that's your style. Like, you get mad. And Peyton does it actually sometimes, too, and he immediately kind of goes viral. Because people like that. And I think Tony's always really struggled with that. Even they tries to play nice with both guys. Like, Jim, I think you should go for it here. Like, just, just pick a lane, Tony. It's okay if you're wrong. But I think yeah. he's always very offend. He's always very hesitant, it feels like, to offend the coach because he knows these guys well. They all text him. He's buddies with them. And uh, th- that, to me, is my criticism. He just won't say stuff when it's pretty obvious sometimes. I don't care about the play calls. I like having a little fun, whatever. But just say, that was a terrible freaking call, Jim. You, you, that cannot happen in that situation. He's just never going to. Or Troy, I would say Troy, especially once Tony got a lot of money, has no problem laying the law down. And people enjoy that. Yeah. So I think to me, if I had to pick a play, the play of the game to me, it's the third quarter, uh, the San Francisco fumble punt, which allows Mahomes next play touchdown 13-10. I felt like until that point, I thought, San Francisco not only had the physical momentum, the emotional momentum, uh, the game. I thought they just they they were the better team. I did think that was the moment in the game, and San Francisco came back. But I did think that put pressure on Purdy. That put pressure on Shannon. Okay, now you trail Mahomes. Now they responded very well. But to me, to me, it was sort of a defining play. It was like you looked up and went, Kansas City leads. They're getting outplayed significantly. And I, and in, in that moment, I thought, okay, they're going to win this game. They're going to figure out a way to do it. That's my defining moment of the game. Third quarter. Is there one for you? I would say there were multiple moments where the Niners had a chance to basically hold them to field goals and, or, or super long field goals and Andy and Mahomes dialed up the perfect play. And they got a 20-yard gain to Kelsey across the middle. They got that long play to Rice. And when I think this season, when it comes to Andy and Mahomes, was not about the 70-yard bombs. It was not really about the highlight package that will define Mahomes' early career. It was about doing the stuff Tom Brady and Peyton Manning did, that Joe Montana did, that Troy Aikman did, that ultimately wins you games. This, To me, this defining stretch, but specifically today, was about kind of the boring cliche winning football. And it was, we know you're bringing the house here. We're going one-on-one coverage with a linebacker that's not going to be able to cover. And we're going to get Kelsey in space. He's going to get a big game. And it's going to be the momentum shift of that play on third and seven where Butker might have to kick a 48-yard field goal. Now we're first and 10 at the 13-yard line. And you're just like, oh my God, they're going to win the game. And, and they did that multiple times a day in the fourth quarter and obviously in overtime. I think I feel like they did it multiple times in overtime. Well, big Rice first down, a big Mahomes run that was just, you know, not every play with Michael Jordan were fadeaway game-winning jumpers. There was just a lot of winning basketball. Some of Tiger's stuff was just, he got up and down when he had to on hole 14 when no one was paying attention that most guys bogey. And they did stuff like that today, which is the highest level of football, right? Brett Favre, all the great players, you know, the physical guys can make the spectacular play. Steph Curry the other night. But he does so much other stuff that's winning. And today, like, I thought Mahomes and Andy were just so dialed in when it mattered the most. What, what a special – listen, I've known Andy now 15 years. What, what a great moment for him. You know, back-to-back Super Bowls. Not many guys in the history of the league. And like I said, I, I think this is one of the great five, six-year runs in, in my lifetime of just a team. Do it multiple different ways. Like, remember some of those Yankee teams, right, in the late 90s. They weren't all the same. When You, you get more credit when you do it like that, right? And, and I think today was – they're just th- – this was their grittiest, toughest, smartest, and just refusing to kind of wilt and just finding a way, almost digging it out of the dirt. They didn't really have to do that earlier on, right? That's and, right. and now they had to, and now I, I don't think – I don't think they'll ever be a human – they're not going to win every Super Bowl, but no one's ever putting money on the other team against these guys ever again. Yeah, no and, uh, and I think we not said me. it earlier. It, it, no, the great teams – the great teams win it when you think – Oh, this is the, I said it all year. I said, this is their pivot year. Stage one of the dynasty is Mahomes isn't making any money. Stage two is, oh, we got to make some cuts. And last year I thought, oh, they're just too young on defense. Oh, and this year I'm like, they're just not good enough at wide receiver. And they won. This two-year stretch has got to be discouraging. 
because Baltimore's stacked and San Francisco's stacked and Philadelphia is stacked. And you're like, oh, shit, these are the, these are the pivot years. So, all right, John Middlecoff, former scout, three and out, good hour, 15. Um, what a Super Bowl. Oh, so good. So good. So now uh, we talk about it for a couple days. Uh, then there's March heats up. It's NFL free agency. I, I don't think um, Chris Jones will get paid. Uh, San Francisco doesn't have a ton of needs. Um, hard to pay two linebackers. They probably have to get another corner. Um, they also have to start examining. I think they drafted a tight end last year. They got to get another tight end in there. I think you you made a good point earlier. Kittle's a great player, but the gap between Kelsey and Kittle in big games. Jesus. Travis, really. The two best big game tight ends I've ever seen, Gronk and Kelsey. This this was a great playoff run for Travis Kelsey. I'd say the highlight of the Niners week now after losing this game is Trent Williams said earlier that win or lose this game, he's still got a couple years in. He likes playing for the Niners and Kyle. So that's that's one positive. Trent is still pretty damn – even though he had a couple offsides, but when you're that yeah. good, you can live with a couple offsides. So the big guy's not going anywhere. But he's he's getting older. You know, you're not going to have him forever. Yep. All right, John. That was fun. Um, I was. You, you let me know. Take... I'm, I'm here. You, you want to talk some football? We got we got combine in a couple of weeks. I think I might go. I think I might go. It's going to be a oh, big be combine. Great. A lot of stuff going on. All right. I'll tell our management to send your shit to Indy. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> in a Marriott hotel room somewhere. <laughs> Good seeing you, buddy. See you soon.